Warren Gerlach is going to lead whoever wants for this class a walk through the Stations of the Cross, um, which is what we do. This is the second year that she's done this. Um, and she will meet you in the narthex after class on Tuesday. So this is Tuesday, Tuesday the 26th, because this Friday <laughs> to Sunday is Palm Sunday. And so next week is Holy Week, right? So we will have class on Tuesday, obviously. No reason not to. And she will lead a walk, the walk through the stations of the cross after class on Tuesday. Just meet her in the narthex. So, any questions about, about that? Okay. Well, what it, the stations of the cross, yes, because what it is, you're just down, now the crowd will leave without you, but yes, because you could, you, you're, just, you're just downloading and playing each station. So there's a QR code that you can use to get, and then it's just recording. So you could sit, you could be at your house and go through week out, but you wa it won't have the movement associated with it, which ends up, what? You don't need the movement? You don't have the movement. <laughs> okay, well, it's good you know that then, isn't it? Yes, yes. All right, so otherwise, we're here on Tuesdays. Um, this Sunday is Palm Sunday, meaning a week from Thursday is Monday Thursday. A week from Friday is Good Friday. A week from Sunday is Easter. You don't want to miss any of that. You want to participate in it, in it all. I hope that you will come to Monday Thursday and that you will come to Good Friday. My class on Sunday at 11 o'clock, even if you're not a regular part of the class at 11 o'clock on Sunday, you could come. We don't bite. You could come. And we're going to walk through Holy Week each day. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Everything, what happens each day of Holy Week um, coming from, built off of Mark's Gospel. So um, just with maps and photos and all of that, I think it, it, it helps to make to make us be a bit grounded in the week. And I've done that on Palm Sunday for the last few years, and I like doing it. So anyway, we're going to do that. Come along, 11 o'clock, Smith Worship Center on Sunday. So let's see. No other announcements. Miss Patty is not with us today. She is with her sister, who is in town for a few days. Mona, kindly check the streamers for us. Hello, streamers. I think you're online. All is good. <coughs> So I am going to start the podcast, and then I will open us up in prayer. And then we'll see if there's anything y'all want to talk about before we get back into the book of Acts, okay? Does that all sound good? All right. So on this Tuesday, please pray with me. Gracious Lord, we are grateful. Here it is, just days before Palm Sunday approaching Holy Week and Easter. And we're grateful for the opportunity to come together like this and to study your word and just, just really be grounded in our faith and uh, use this time to understand better how you work in this world, how you worked in this world in the first century and indeed grasp better that the work of those in the first century is indeed our work today. And we pray that your spirit would fill us with lots of energy and enthusiasm and wisdom as, uh, as we go forward today. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, my friends, is there anything you would like to talk about before we get going? Does everybody know why it's called Monday Thursday? Y'all know this? No. See, you don't know why it's called Monday Thursday. It comes from the Latin word mandatum for commandment because Jesus says in John's gospel, love others as I have loved you. So that's why it's called Monday Thursday. So I don't know who came up with that, but long time ago, Lent has been practiced by Christians for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years as the Christians began to realize that they needed they needed what? They needed help 
in being grounded in their faith and preparing themselves for Good Friday, for Easter. Um, there are two seasons of preparation in the Christian calendar. One is Advent. That's a season of preparation for Christmas, the Incarnation. And then Lent is the other season of preparation, um, preparing ourselves for um, Easter Sunday and Good Friday. So, anyway. I do have one question, Scott. When did the cross become an important symbol for the Christian church? That is a really good question, and it's surprising. Yeah, it's surprising to people. Not in the early days. It becomes a symbol that we see emerging in the latter 2nd century, 3rd century. The cross becomes the dominant symbol of Christianity. Early on, from what we can see and the evidence we have, it was like a fish because of you could take the meaning of the word ichthyos, which in the Greek is fish, and use that to construct this symbol of, of the name of Christ. But it takes a while for the cross to emerge. And I think that is because the cross is such a shocking symbol. It's, you know, our crosses are all cleaned up, aren't they? I mean, look at the cross we have in the sanctuary. It hangs up there. It's in all this polished wood and all this kind of stuff. It's just lovely. And if we wanted something hanging there that was more representative of how the world saw a cross in Jesus' day, we would not have a cross hanging there. We would have an electric chair. A nasty old rusty beaten up na electric chair hanging there. It was uh, the cross was so crucifixion was so awful it wasn't spo even spoken of in polite company. Roman citizens could not be crucified. Um, yet it became this this symbol of of love. Of love. There are significant portions of the New Testament in which, including whole books, in which the word love does not appear. The reason is because if you went to Paul and you said, hey, what's love? He'd probably just point you to the cross and he would say, that's what love is. So the dominant image is not the word love, but the dominant image is the cross. And it is the embodiment of love because it expresses God's love for us. Jesus' love, that he would be faithful all the way to death, even death on a cross, Paul writes. That's why he writes it that way in Philippians. Even death on a cross because it was so humiliating, so terrible. And the shame part of it was as awful as the physical part of it. And... and they live in an honor and shame culture, and it was unspeakably humiliating and shameful to be crucified. That's why people who were crucified, at least the men, were generally naked when they were crucified. It's, and you might say, well, why would that be? Just more humiliation. That's it, just piling humiliation on top of humiliation. So, yeah. And, and it's not surprising then, in my view, that it took a while for the cross to emerge as this symbol. At the same way it took time for the writings of the New, New Testament to emerge as this collection of agreed-upon sacred and inspired writings. Yes? So was it Andrew who got <coughs> the, 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 the legend of Andrew, well, the legend of Peter is that he was crucified upside down Andrew on a cross shaped like this, an X. And the, the, the J Andrew, the tradition around Andrew is that he made his way to Scotland. And that's why if you look at the Scottish flag, it's a blue background with a white cross like this. And if you go to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, you'll see the statue of, St of Andrew is with an X-shaped cross. So there were crosses of different types, but doesn't matter 
how they were shaped. They were <coughs> after the same end, which was a horribly humiliating, slow death. Um, and it was the worst thing that Romans knew how to inflict on somebody. So, so what's the significance of being upside down? Because Peter said, I don't want to, the tradition is that Peter said, I don't want to be crucified like my Lord, I'm not worthy. So he has to be crucified upside down. That's a, the tradition as I remember it. One of these times on Sundays, I'll do a series with the traditions of what happened to each apostle. Because that's what we have. Our, our traditions of them, right? That the church had and collected. And you can't necessarily separate, you know, fact from legend and all of that kind of thing. But the traditions still matter because the traditions are focal points for our devotion. It's like going to Holy Land. You don't know where everything happened. You want to know exact. We're Westerners. We want to know exactly where everything happened. We want to know exactly what time things happen. We want to know the order of everything that happens. And you can't, you can't, you can't. But these places can be places of devotion, right? Devotion um, to Christ and, and to the church and to his work. So, anything else? Okay, well, let's plunge back into the book of Acts. So we are, last week we finished up Acts 7, and we saw that at the end of Acts 7, poor Stephen, one of the seven deacons, was stoned to death, right? He was, uh, he so enraged the crowd and the Sanhedrin and so forth, that they chased him and put him to death by stoning. And uh, my friend Joe Armstrong reminded me that the place of the garden tomb in Jerusalem is remembered as a place where Jews took people to be stoned. Now, to the best of our knowledge, by Jesus' day, stoning was very unusual. You know, we have two, two, two stories of it, basically, in Scripture. One with the woman in John, in the book of John, Gospel of John, the adulterous woman, and the other with Stephen. And I was asked last week after class, well, if the Jews had to take Jesus to Pilate to be put to death because they didn't have the power of capital punishment, how is it they're able to stone Stephen to death and I thought that was a really good question and the answer is that the stoning of Stephen is what amounts to a lynching it's illegal it happens because they're enraged it's a mob it's a mob who hauls Stephen out and stones him to death and in that um, there is this incredible moment when we're told that Stephen looked up to heaven where he is, you know, where he is um, seeing Jesus sitting at the right hand of God and he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit as Jesus did. He, um, he says, Lord, do not hold the, this sin against them as Jesus did. So there are these very powerful parallels. And at the end of verse 60, it says, when he her had said this, he fell asleep, which means it's just a euphemism for dying. Now, at the beginning of chapter 8, the very first sentence of chapter 8 should be with chapter 7. The, the, the English dudes who did the chapter and verse divisions kind of got a little off track here because, <laughs> yeah, well, it happens. There's a few places like that. And so... The very last portion of the story is that Saul approved their killing of Stephen. He is holding the cloaks. Saul approves of their killing. This is Saul, the Pharisee. Later we find out that he is, a, um, he is an intellectual, a student of Gamaliel, a man of great zeal and passion and intellect and en energy. Um, and right now... It's being directed at the followers of Jesus. This, you have to see, the G, to, to get what's happening, you need to see the Jesus movement as basically like a cult. 
with the Judaism, right? And so the, 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 the Jewish leaders who have rejected Jesus, they see it as a threat to Judaism, a cult-like threat. And so they are determined to stamp it out. Um, I think what they are most concerned about is their own positions, their own wealth, their own authority. But in any event, if you see it as a cult, you will better understand why so many Jews reject it. When Paul goes around the Mediterranean preaching the good news, is he well received in the synagogues? No, he's not well received in the synagogues. He's beaten up, spat upon, chased out of town, left for dead. And he usually ends up having to go to speak in the public square to the Gentiles, most of whom, they probably chuckle and move on, thinking, oh man, how silly a God to get himself crucified, you know? But uh, for the Jews, it is, it is active and it is angry and... Stephen is the first and not the last victim. So look at chapter 8 at the end. This is the second part of the first verse, really where chapter 8 should begin, okay? It just reminds us, don't, don't ever forget that the Bible as written does not have divis chapter divisions. It does not have verse divisions. Verse divisions can be helpful to us in that we can all come to a room like this and find our way around pretty quickly. So if I told you to, to turn to the, you know, the book of Hezekiah, chapter 2, verse 10, you would know what to look for, except for the fact there is no book of Hezekiah. <laughs> so other than that, <laughs> I'm in a rare mood. So <laughs> chapter 2, verse 10, yeah, you would not understand chapter 2, verse 10. Now what is the downside to the versification of Holy Scripture. Human yeah, human interpretation that we, what happens is we end up wanting to use the verses as little cannonballs and bombs in little <laughs> theological wars. Well, look at this, 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 look at this. And what ends up happening is people are so inclined to just rip the verses out of any context and use them as like little missiles or something and just saying, well, the Bible says that I believe it. Well, that's not enough. That is not enough. This, is, this, this exercise of reading the Bible well is not straightforward. It is an art, and you can be better at it, and you can be poorer at it. So, and we aim to be better readers of Scripture. So we... we So we hear the Holy Spirit well who uses these pages to speak to us. So chapter 8, still in the first verse, second half of it, new paragraph. On that day, this is, what day is that? The day of Stephen's stoning, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. The leadership is determined to stamp this out. They've had Peter and John come before them. We're told of a couple times. It might have been more times. Don't, you know, don't think that you're getting this complete, this complete record of all things that happened, right? So no, you don't. We know, we know the church is being persecuted. Peter and John have. Stephen has now been stoned. The leaders want it stepped out. And, and Paul and Saul, Saul, approved of every bit of it. So on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So they, what does that mean? It means they are <laughs> leaving town for a while, the Christians are. Why? Because it's just too hot. To, uh, to, uh, to the heat is on in Jerusalem. And so the believers scatter. Now, what is the irony in this? Tell me the irony in this. 
well, it happened to them, but, but, but what's the bigger, what did Jesus tell people to do? To go out. The Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And now what is the leadership, the Jewish leaders of causing to have happen? They're all going. You know, they might have been comfortable sitting at home, you know, eating their dinner and watching their TV and whatever it might be. I don't know. But, but, but no, now the irony, it's the, it's the, it's a persecution that is driving these Christians out, out, out. Jesus wants us to go out, not to be comfortable. That's the Tower of Babel story in Genesis 11 is about the people's unwillingness to do as God told them because they were supposed to scatter through the earth and renew it and be fruitful and multiply and but they're comfortable in their little world and they even build this tower there's so God smashes it all makes them speak different languages and off they go out so here it is again out out verse 2 godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him I bet but Saul there he is again began to destroy the church going from house to house he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison so he is scouring the city for Christians so let me let me show you a map of where Saul is actually from. He is from Tarsus, which is right there, okay? Uh, there we go, right there. That is Asia Minor. That is a Greco-Roman, it's a Roman province. It's embedded in the Greco-Roman world. That's where he's from originally. He went to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel so he is an individual who is comfortable in both the Greco-Roman world familiar with that world familiar with things like the Greco-Roman religions and the pagan philosophers like Plato and Aristotle um, and but he is still a Jew a Pharisee a second temple Pharisee and if you can't see the map you have study maps, I hope, in the back of your Bible, which I hope you will get comfortable with because they are your friend. Okay? So Saul is going from house to house, dragging off men and women. This is equal opportunity persecution. Right? I, yes. The Jewish leadership. He's part of the Jewish leadership. Yeah. I mean, the, the Pharisees had a lot of power because of the way they were perceived as the keepers of the law, right? So you meet, a num you meet different Pharisees. Nicodemus, who comes to see Jesus in the night, is a Pharisee. Um, but you, as you get to know this man, Saul slash Paul, you realize because of his energy, his zeal, his intellect, his discipline, the rest, he's of course going to emerge as a leader. Right now he's a leader, but it's a leader persecuting the Christians, right? These Jesus people. Yes. What? House arrest typically, something like that. They didn't really have, you know, nowadays we have prisons where people are sentenced for like 10 years and that's not how it was. You, you generally went under house arrest or something until your case could be resolved. And you either let go or it was off with your head, whatever it might be. But they didn't have this system of long-term confinement, um, gen generally speaking. Paul seems to have been under house arrest in Ephesus for a long time. Same thing happens to him in Rome. But it, that was, he was kind of an unusual case. But they didn't build big prisons. They had, they had places where they could confine people for a long time. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like the Tower of London, you know. The Tower of London wasn't this big prison where holding thousands of people, 
but people could rot away in there if you were put in there like Thomas More and others right that the king had singled out to, to be dealt with yes No, the majority of population in Tarsus would be pagan, Greek, Roman, right? Not the, they're, the only Christians right now are still in Jerusalem. He grew up in Tarsus, a Jew, so there's a Jewish community in Tarsus. And then he came, he emigrated, uh, there's a word for today, he emigrated to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel. But he would have grown up in the Jewish community in Tarsus. The largest Jewish community outside Jerusalem in the Roman Empire is actually in Alexandria, Egypt, which is right, right there. It's, it's one of the major cities in the Roman Empire. It's also a very large community of Jews. What? <sighs> Greek? Greek was everybody's second language if it wasn't their first language. And in Tarsus, they would have spoken Greek. He would have, you know, given its history because these lands were all conquered by Alexander the Great 300 years before Jesus. And so that's why we call it the Greco-Roman world. It's still dominated by the Greek language. It's dominated by Greek ideas. It's dominated by the Greek gods and goddesses. The Romans renamed the, you know, Zeus becomes Jupiter, but it's still the same pantheon of, of gods and goddesses. And that's the world he grows up in, right? So even if, even if as a Jew he was living apart from that world, he would have still been very much exposed to it. And you can see it in his writings when he talks about the philosophers and the worldly wisdom, which is a way of speaking of the philosophers. When he goes to Athens, he's familiar with the philosophers, the unknown God, and the rest of it because he, he, he is uniquely suited to the mission that Jesus will give him in chapter 9. <laughs> in chapter 9. Okay? Anything else? All right. Now, Verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. There's that irony again. Look at that. They're chased out of town by the authorities, and look at it. That word is spreading. Philip, this is Philip the evangelist. This is not Philip the apostle. This is the Philip who is in the list of the seven, like Stephen was. Okay? Philip went down to a city in Samaria. So let me back up my slides here just to make sure. Again, if you can't see it, you can use your study Bible. Samaria is an area between Galilee in the north, it's Jewish. Judea in the south, it's Jewish. Samaria is not Jewish. The way I describe it is Samaria is filled with people whom the Jews view as having once been on the team, but then left the team. And now they're back. Yeah, what? That's they couldn't get to the country. Yeah, that could be. That could be. So the Samaritans, you encounter them in Scripture. Generally speaking, the devout Jews of Galilee, when they would make a trip from Galilee to Jerusalem, they would leave Galilee and they would cross over to the Jordan River and come down the eastern side, cross over and up. And the reason they did that was they didn't want to go through Samaria. Knowing that is what gives power to the parable of the Good Samaritan. When Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, when in John chapter 4, the Samaritans in her village are the first ones to acknowledge who Jesus is. It's really just quite striking. Um, but Jesus said, everybody, remember? 
Remember the all, A-L-L, everybody. This is for what Jesus has done. What God has done in and through Jesus is for everybody. The Jews are merely the vehicle. They weren't chosen for their own sake. They were chosen for the sake of the world. That's, that was their job, was to be the ones through whom God would rescue humanity. So now that time has come, and Jesus says, Go, make disciples of all nations. Go and be, be, go and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And now that is coming to pass. And so Philip goes down to a city in Samaria and proclaim the Messiah there. Going down, that always confused me for a long time because it, you're, he's going north to Samaria. That's not the way we talk about things. Where we live, we go up to the North Pole. But that's it, all, this is Jerusalem. It is the site of God's temple. It's the center of everything for the Jews. Hence, every direction is down. When people are going to come to Jerusalem, they're going to go up to Jerusalem from every direction, whether it is geographic, topographic or not, doesn't matter. Everything goes up to Jerusalem. Everything comes down from Jerusalem. So Philip goes down from Jerusalem to Samaria where he is going to be preaching, proclaiming the Messiah. Proclaiming what? That indeed Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah raised up by God, the long-awaited Messiah that God had promised the Jews and hence the world. So verse 6, When the crowds heard Philip, and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. I love that. They all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now the city is not named. Their, their choices is just not named. We don't know what, what Samaritan city this is. So let's talk about the shrieking and stuff, these impure spirits. Ancient people lived in a world where most of what happened, they did not have what you and I would call natural explanations of science and physics and chemistry and geology and astronomy and the, they don't have any of that none of that they don't know what a germ is they can't contemplate that there's these invisible little things that kill people they don't know they don't know about any of that they live in a world populated with a lot of impure spirits Sometimes they're called demons, sometimes they're not. They are these impure spirits who cause a lot of problems for people. The theology is here, the theology here is that these impure spirits are part of a world that is broken and sinful. And that under Christ's authority, the kingdom of God has arrived and there's not room in the kingdom of God for these impure spirits. So under the authority of Jesus, they flee. Same way the healings are enactments of the kingdom of God because in the kingdom of God, there are no blind, there are no lame, there are no... I flew airplanes. That's not a good sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, even the healings, you see, in the kingdom of God, there are no um, blind and lame and crippled and deaf and the rest of it. So the healings are these little 
moments where the kingdom of God is breaking out. That's what's happening. It happened with Jesus, and now it is still happening. They're still within this time, this, the, when God's Spirit is enabling these miracles when what they really are are these demonstrations that indeed the kingdom of God has arrived. They're the demonstrations that the kingdom of God has arrived. Remember what the first words out of Jesus' mouth in Mark's gospel were. The first words, Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. You know, you, you, it's very easy to focus on the particular miraculous or, as we're about to see, magical act and not raise your head a little bit and see the larger story of what's happening. What's happening is that the kingdom of God arrived in Jesus and now it's breaking out all over the place and even the impure spirits and the demons and whoever else you want to think about all of that. It's all, it's all defeated. And um, so that's what these moments are about. Okay, and of course the people are caught up in it. Who would be? I would be, you would be, and there was great joy in that city. I would like to think it's because some people in that city recognize the larger story of what's happening in Jesus, not focusing simply on particular um, uh, miracles. So, let me pause there and see if there's anything y'all would like to talk about before we go on to Simon, the sorcerer, the magician. So when they're talking about the signs that he performed, those are some semi-miracles you think, John? Or? Yeah, I mean, they are. I mean, yes, you take a, a man who's been crippled and he walks, like in John 3, yes. Okay, yes. But the way to see them is not merely... An act of, the, it is an act of compassion for the person, but you have to see the larger context. The larger context is the kingdom of God broke out in that moment like a flower that blooms because in the kingdom of God there are no cripples. Right? That's this larger picture about what is happening. It's easy to get lost in the, in the details and it's very easy to only see God working in the world in miracle so then what happens when we can explain more and more and more and more and more and more for these people miracles <laughs> is virtually everything that happens because they can't explain anything but for us today we know a lot more about God's creation so we are we are not surprised anymore by what doctors can do with somebody's heart are we things like bypass surgeries where you go in and you open somebody's chest or maybe not even have to open it anymore and and you give them another 20 years of life for us that's you know so you end up if you're not careful, you end up reducing the space in which you see God working. It's called the God of the gaps. God is only God in the gaps between what we can explain. Well, that's dangerous because it gets, gets smaller and smaller because we know more and more about how God's creation works. So instead, see God working in this world in ways large and small, not simply in what you can't explain. See God working on that operating table, right? Guiding and strengthening the doctors, the nurses, and the person who's being operated on. Don't leave God out of any of that, of that stuff. So, but yes, these are what's happening. 
it's setting up the next story. So these things are happening. So people are being healed and wow, all kinds of stuff is happening. The city is agog and they're excited and there's great joy in this, this You didn't see that. Samaritan city. <laughs> Verse 9. Well, okay, so now we're going to have a story. Going to meet somebody. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in, this, in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. There were many magic doers in the ancient world. There have always been a decent number of magic doers, but, you know, it's harder for a lot of people now to, to do that. But in this world where they don't really have explanation for much, there are a lot of tricks of the trade that people like Simon could utilize, utilize in order to build a career. Think of Pharaoh's magicians. When Moses and Aaron come and God confronts Pharaoh in the book of Exodus and the plagues begin to happen, how's the story go? Well, the Pharaoh's magicians are able to keep up with a little bit. They've got some tricks of their own. They've got some tricks of their own. But what happens? Well, they begin to fall away. They can't keep up forever. They fall away. So, so magic had a real important place in the ancient world. It was not uncommon. Um, I'm thinking of hmm, I'm thinking of the movie The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> right? With the little old man in his wagon, and he's got this crystal ball that he can utilize to tell people the future. Now, can you think he can actually see the future in his crystal ball? No, but he knows how to utilize it, and people want to know, right? Here we go. So Simon has made a nice little career of practicing sorcery, magic, is what we're talking about, in this Samaritan city, and amazed all the people of Samaria. So he's good at it. Probably makes a comfortable living. He boasted that he was someone great. Because look what he can do. And all the people, both high and low, both important and just everyday folk, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. Now, the Samaritans are not Jewish, but he is still calling upon their theistic ideas to say, look what I can do. I obviously have in my hands the great power of God. In fact, I am the great power of God. You can just see him working it. I mean, look what that little professor did in Oz, right? <laughs> behind the little guy behind the curtain, right? So... We love magic. I enjoy magic a lot. I do. You see some great skills. Um, but we're going to see where this leads Simon. And, of course, for him, he is exploiting it in a way that I don't think I've seen a magician do in our time to stand up and say, well, look, I can make pull a rabbit out of the hat. I am the great power of God. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Verse 11. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Wow, that's a long phrase. So Philip is there. Philip is preaching. When they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, which is if you proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, you're proclaiming Jesus. All the way through Acts, we will have to remember that a name is synonymous with the identity of the person in a way it's not in our world. 
okay? You can call upon the name of someone, and it's calling upon that person in a way it's not in our world where names are generally just labels. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Why were they baptized? Because that's what Jesus said to do. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey and the rest of it. Yeah. So, yeah, he, Philip is preaching. There, there's baptisms happening. And s verse 13, Simon himself believed. In the Greek, it, he faced. I've talked about this many times. The underlying Greek word is faith. Simon faced. We just don't have a verb form of faith anymore, so we substitute the word believe. Simon himself faithed, believed, and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So what's happening? Pat. He's following Simon. Philip said, I'm going to figure this out because this guy's got a really good gig. Look at this. He's got a better show than I got. So I'm going to follow him around. I'm going to figure out his tricks. You ever seen the Steve Martin movie, The Leap of Faith, where he's, a, he, he's an evangelist to, and a healer who's got his tricks that he uses? Um, yeah. To, to like heal people and stuff. But it's with Deborah Winger as a little trusty assistant who's helping him do it. Ever read the book Elmer Gantry? That's a good book. Seen the movie with... Um, yeah, Lancaster, Bert Lancaster, yeah. Well, verse 14. Now, when the apostles heard when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, now that's a broad sentence, right? There's a certain amount of hope probably. Everybody in Samaria is not putting their faith in Jesus. But this is a real big thing that's happening. They sent Peter and they sent John to Samaria. So Philip's down there with the Holy Spirit doing his thing and now... And the word has come back to Jerusalem, and so two apostles, Peter and John, are going to go down and check it out. That's, only, that's the only responsible thing to do, is it not? When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers, for the new believers there, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Huh. Hmm. So that is a sentence which gives rise to some people saying, well, Scott, you know, you might have been baptized when you were a little wee one, but have you received the Holy Spirit yet? You know, this, this, this second baptism, we might call it. The trouble with that theology is that there are a number of ways that baptism and the arrival of the Holy Spirit are depicted in the book of Acts. So you can't pick just one. Why are they separated like this? Why have these people been baptized, yet the Holy Spirit has not yet been given to them? If Though it's not stated explicitly, if you ask me, it is because the apostles need to be part of this. The apostles need to be part of this. It's just that simple. The apostles need to be part of this. The same way, I guess, if you notice at St. Andrew, who... Who actually does, performs baptisms? Who is it restricted to? Only the ordained clergy. 
I've, I've participated in many baptisms, but I've never baptized someone because I am not ordained. I think it's that same idea. Here the people were baptized um, by Philip. Though it doesn't even say explicitly that he, he did it. Um, they are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay. So, but look at verse 17. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So, there you go. So now they have been baptized. They have received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to Christians. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, and um, baptism is an important um, part of that. It's an essential part. I don't want to use the word essential. It is an extremely important part of that journey from of that entry into the body of Christ. But it's not, to use a somewhat fancy word, it's not salvific, S-A-L. It's not salvific. Baptism does not convey salvation. It is a means of grace, but it's not. And um, there was a young man at the church who heard some poor teachings at a different church and came to me and filled with questions and because the church had basically said baptism was salvific. It was something that had to happen to a person for them to be saved. So I asked this young man, I said, okay, so let's, um, let's have a thought experiment. Imagine on th Thursday, the man, there's a man who has, who comes to faith in Jesus Christ. God reaches him out to him, God grabs him, the man falls on his knees, he gives himself over to Jesus as genuinely as Paul does on the road to Damascus when he is knocked to the ground. And the man calls up his pastor and says, oh, pastor, I've given myself to Jesus. I, I, you know, whatever words their church uses, you know, I've accepted Jesus into my heart or all these other non-biblical ways we have of talking about this. And and the pastor says, great, well, we're going to baptize you on Sunday then, Bob. So Bob gets himself all ready. On Saturday, he's run over by a truck. <laughs> is he out of luck then? Because he didn't get to the baptismal font on Sunday. The, answer's, the right answer is no. The badge of membership in the body of Christ, in those who have been saved, simply says faith in Jesus Christ. Pistis Christu, faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that what the guy on the thought said to Jesus? I mean, he wasn't baptized. He wasn't baptized. And Jesus said, they, they would be with me in paradise. All Jesus wanted was the man was turning himself over to Jesus, basically, right? That's it. So baptism is an essential part. But interestingly, in the early church, we know for a number of decades, maybe a couple of centuries, um, that, bat, that people who came to join, they said, I, I want to be part of this. They went through a three-year period of catechism, instruction. At the end of that three-year period, they were baptized. That's kind of a different notion, you know. The best that we do today is we might have like four baptism classes we want somebody to take before they become baptized. But, yeah, so it, it is a means of grace. It is one of two sacraments given us by Jesus. But it does not confer salvation in and of itself. Yes. You're such a shrinking violet today, <laughs> Andy. I didn't hear you. Why then do we baptize those kids who haven't come to faith in anything? 
we have, why, see, these are the discussions we have on staff. Why do we baptize little kids? Because we will see in the book of Acts that whole households are baptized. So the question is, when those entire households are baptized, are the kids left out? Most Christians said, no, they're not left out. Infant baptism has been the baptism practiced by the Christian church for 2,000 years. The idea of not including children only goes back about 500 years to the Anabaptists during the Reformation. But let me give you something that will make you even more comfortable. Baptism is about being part, but entering into this community of faith, right? Being part of the people of God. Part of the people of God. So let's go back to the story of the Exodus. Charlton Heston, the whole thing. When the Red Sea parts and the people go across to salvation, the story of the Exodus is the great salvation event in the Old Testament. We're going to preach about it after Easter. The great salvation event. So when they go from slavery in Pharaoh, Pharaoh, not Phaedo, <laughs> when they go from slavery to Pharaoh to freedom in God, what do they do with their children? They pick them up, throw them in their arms, and carry them across. Do the children understand what's happening? Nah. The little babies, I mean, they don't understand. They're just, they are part of their family. Their family is part of the body of the people of God, and the children are carried in that way. Now, when the children grow up in the wilderness, they're going to reach an age where they are free to go back to Egypt if they want to, right? They reach an age where they can affirm their own baptism, their own place in the body of Christ. And that we still do. We just call it confirmation. And we used to, con used to confirm really young children. There are churches that have confirmed children as young as second grade. When I came here, we were doing maybe fifth graders. Is that about right? And then it kept getting older, and now it's like ninth graders. Why ninth graders? Because we want them to be mature and adult enough to be Christians on purpose. That's what, that's what confirmation is. The time that you step forward and said, I know my parents carried me across the Red Sea, but now I am a Christian on purpose. It's called confirmation because you're confirming what was already done for you. But you do have, we being good Wesleyans, you do have the opportunity to walk away if you wish. And undoubtedly some do between their baptism and their confirmation. Okay, so. I think another important piece is when we sit in the congregation the day of the baptism, mm -hmm. Spot on. Pay attention to the questions that you affirm. Every time there's a baptism, we, the congregation, affirm that, yes, you know, baptism is a team sport. Christianity is a team sport, right? We're all, there is no healthy relationship with Jesus without a relationship with his body. And um, so, anyway, yeah. Yes. Would I compare confirmation with bar mitzvah? I don't. I mean, you know what they both kind of are? They are both kind of a very common human experience of having a time, a ritual, a process for the transition from childhood to adulthood. 
right? Confirmation among Christians is this is the time when you are now old enough to be a Christian on purpose and confirm that. For the Jews, you have bar mitzvahs for the boy, bat mitzvahs for the girls. It's their time, right? Because the young man can now read, he re as part of the, he reads from, goes to, he learns his Hebrew and he can read from the Hebrew scrolls as a man, right? The um, Maasai warriors would take the young men, 13 years old, out in the wilderness to kill a lion. It marked their passage from childhood to adulthood. And that's really, that's really good. I'd say if, you know, that, that, that's a part of it, but um, theologically there would be other things going on in, in it, I think. Okay. Yes. Well, most of the time it doesn't say how much water they actually used. You know, whether it might have been a quart, a pint. There is a, in among the Jews, their ritual of cleansing was to be done in running water, which is why that they had um, water in, that homes that could afford it would have down in the basement a little place where they could go and water would be running through it. But then again, it John 2, you have these water of cleansing that's merely in a big jar. So I think I've, my counsel to people is just do whatever you are most comfortable with. There's, there's no more v virtue in being dunked than in the sprinkling of an infant or even an adult. And if you want the pastor to give you more water, <laughs> they can certainly do it. <laughs> when, 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 when I've taken groups to Israel, in Israel we remember our baptisms, except for a few people who had, weren't sure whether they had ever been baptized. And they were baptized in the Jordan River. But for all everybody else, what? Right yeah, right here. But for everybody else, we remember our baptisms because they're one baptism for all time. You're, you're not re-baptized. Okay, so we remember our baptism. And I would always ask people, do you want a little water or a lot? And the ladies would often come up and they would say, well, you know, just a little because I think they're worried about like you know, their makeup or something, you know. And, and so the, the men would stride up and they'd say, yeah, just give it to me. And so I'd take a big handful. And if they said, if they said, I don't care. Guess what I did? I nearly drowned them. <laughs> I was part of a Baptist Bible study. Yes. And they would not let me read the Bible during Bible study because I was not baptized. So I said, I was baptized as an infant. I took three years. Well, th okay, so for those of you who can't hear Charlotte, she was in a Baptist Bible study, and they said she couldn't read the Bible in the Bible study because she had not been baptized by dunking. Okay, that is just all man's rules is what that is, and it is, in my humble opinion, an affront to God. That's what I said. Yeah, well, you, I think you said the right thing. Yeah, there's no reason, there's no reason to be like that. There's not. You know, I thought you were going to say they wouldn't let you eat it because you were a woman. <laughs> yes, well, some Baptist churches are totally into the dunking things that they would, I've been told they would say to me, well, Scott, if you want to join our church, you need to be dunked, but it's really just a witness to others. We, we're not telling you you weren't a Christian. Because that's what it amounts to, right? If they say to you, well, you know, you have to be dunked. They're saying to me, I've lived my whole 73 years. 
and I haven't been a Christian. And, and that's, no, 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 no. A lot of people, were, we want to be just like the Pharisees and all the rest. We want to build lots of rules and lots of traditions and lots of this and lots of this around scripture and religion and the church and people like it and they want it and we may create all of these rules and by and large they all should be burnt down and torn down because it is not it is not jesus's way do you have faith in jesus christ that is the question that is the only thing on the membership badge don't add don't add anything else to it. Don't add anything else to it. So is there something biblical that I could have brought up that said, like one baptism? What do you mean one baptism? Well, yeah, there, there is a passage. I, I don't know. I think it's maybe Ephesians. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and so forth. But they're not. That's not going to hold in water for them. You know, people have their traditions, and they become a source of their identity and they cling very tightly to them. So my advice to you would have been to find another Bible study. <laughs> and look, girl, you have. Okay. Gosh, what is happening here? What, what is the deal? -y? Okay, well, let's just go a little bit further with Simon. I got five minutes left. Your, your cars are there. You don't have, don't hurt yourselves getting up. They're not going to restribe until 2 o'clock. I don't want to hear about any broken bones. People are running to their cars so fast. Okay, verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. That's the way his brain is working. He offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you, this is why I'm closing with this. What is the deal? Okay. Simon becomes a fairly important memory in the Christian church. And he becomes known as Simon Magus, Simon the Magician. He becomes really representative of those who abused the church. And when you approach the time of the Protestant reformers, there was a word created to describe the purchasing of church offices. What is that? I don't know. I don't really know what it could be. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. And it was called simony. S-I-M-O-N. Sim Y. Simony. And it would be where if you were a family of money, you know, your land would go to your eldest son, and then you have to ask yourself, well, what does my second son do and my third son do? Well, your second son might go into the army, and you might purchase a commission for your second son, and for your third son, well, you might purchase, you might purchase a bishopric from the church for your third son. And that was called simony, the purchasing of church offices. And it was one of the practices that the Protestant reformers said was wrong, 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 wrong. And it was. But that's where we are in the story of Simon. Now, he is offering money to be able to, to, to baptize and have the Spirit come on people because he wants to be able to do all the same things that he sees those people like Apostle um, Peter and John and Philip do. So we will pick up the story of Simon and Philip next week, Philip the Evangelist, and you will also meet next week the Ethiopian eunuch. Oh, yeah. So, would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, as we leave here today, just hold us close, strengthen us in our faith, help us realize that it comes down to simply putting our faith and trust in you, Lord. That's it. 
Let us not listen to those who want to begin a- adding all these other things to it that we must or must not do. It is about faith in Jesus Christ and then living out that life of faith as evidenced in kindness and compassion and gentleness in love toward you and in love toward others. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.